A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink. The woman said, How can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for water? Jesus replied, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never be thirsty again. The Book of John, Chapter 4 They say your life could change in an instant. And mine did when a Jewish man asked me, a Samaritan, for a drink. I have been drinking from the same well for more years than I could count. For me, change seemed impossible. I didn't even want it. But the well always left me thirsty. So I came back to it over and over when no one else could see me. I always came alone. The truth was, I had no husband. He told the truth, the real part of my life, the one I tried to hide, but he looked right through me and met me where I was. He wasn't ashamed of me. He wasn't angry. In my life, I thought I'd experienced love. I thought I was pretty good at finding it too. I didn't even know what love was. On an ordinary day, I went to draw water and had a thirst quenched I didn't even know I had. I don't know if they'll believe me, but I gotta try. I gotta tell them I found the Messiah. Rather, he found me. When I was a senior in high school, I had a chemistry class and we had a brand new teacher that year. It was his first year teaching. And I don't know if he was a very good teacher not. Uh, it was, he had been a scientist out in the field for some time, so, um, so he wasn't a, you know, a young guy just out of college, but it was definitely his first year of teaching. Now, I was not a chemistry student, and so it may be unfair for me to whether or not he was a, a good teacher, but I liked him a lot uh, because he had uh, the, a combination of the, the three cues. You know, the three cues, he was a little quirky, uh, he was quick, and he was uh, quippy. He had funny things to say, and it made it worth paying attention uh, during his classes, if only to pick up the funny stuff that he had to say. Well, one day he had us reading from our chemistry books uh, as if we were in a, a literature class. This may be an indicator that you know, teaching was uh, not coming supernaturally to him at this moment. He had us reading out loud from our chemistry books, and one young man had finished uh, the reading that he was doing, and the teacher said to a young lady in the classroom, would you, would you continue? Would you pick it up from there? And she um, looked up at him with that sort of classic high school uh, combination of sigh and eye roll and said, where are we? And he, without missing a beat, said, you know, that's a question that we all have to ask ourselves at some time. Who am I and where am I going? And she didn't give any indication that she had heard a word that he had said. Nobody else in the classroom did either. But I was laughing sitting at my desk because of how quick uh, and quirky and quippy his, his response was. He took what she meant sort of as an insult, and he elevated it to something way beyond chemistry, but to something about life, these questions that we all come up with. Who am I and where am I going? Look at that 18-year-old with all that hair asking himself those questions. Identity and purpose are linked to one, other, to one another. Who am I? What's my identity? Where am I going? 
What's my purpose? The two are linked together and they really can't be separated. They're so connected, in fact, that we are having two uh, sermons in a row called Called to Purpose here in this Called Sermon series. It was either that or have one really long sermon where we hit both sides of it. And we decided for your sake to break it up into two. You're welcome. Uh, but today we're going to talk about identity. And next week we're going to talk about purpose because one leads the other. Back in 2019, Lifeway Research did a study of 1,010 about the subject of identity. And take a look at some of the things that these uh, people surveyed listed as top markers for their identity. My role in my family, they say, this is the thing that, that marks me, that, that identifies me as who I am. The good that I do, what I've achieved, what I've endured. Do you see yourself on that list anywhere? Do you resonate with any of those things as identifying marks uh, that you might carry uh, that you might carry with you. When we introduce ourselves to somebody new, oftentimes we cover a lot of these, right? Here's what my job is. Here's my place in my family. Here are my hobbies and the things that I do. But there's a problem with using these and markers like them as indicators of our identity. Here's what one of the researchers said. He says, anytime we base our identity on changeable factors, we are setting ourselves up for failure and disappointment. Here's an example. I'm a dad. I have three sons. And for a lot of years, 20 plus years, my job was very dad oriented to get kids up, out of bed, pack some lunches, help them get dressed, get in the car, lots and lots of miles of carpool driving, running to sporting events and band concerts and all of the things, helping with homework, never chemistry homework, but other homework, uh, tell, giving good dad advice, telling bad dad jokes, all of those things that came with being a dad was a big part of my life. But my boys are all grown now. They're out of the house and, and beginning lives of their own. And if my identity was based on a changeable factor, like being a dad, and I still have a role, of course, as a dad, but not in the same way that I did for all those years. If my identity was based on that, what happens now that my boys are out of the house? I don't behave the same way, and it, causes, it could cause me to ask the question, well, who am I? anymore. Or if my identity was based in my job completely and my job were to change or to end or I to retire, it could leave me in a place where I find myself questioning who am I and what am I all about anyway. Anytime we base our identity on changeable factors, we're setting ourselves up for failure and disappointment. So the goal must be to find something that doesn't change on which we base our identity to give us some security. Well, in our gospel lesson today, we meet two people who are on opposite ends of the identity spectrum. We meet the woman at the well. She's never named. She's only known as the Samaritan woman at the well. We meet her struggling with and suffering from what she believes her identity to be. And we meet Jesus laser focused on his identity and his purpose. Now, just a little bit of context around uh, the setting that we find ourselves in in this gospel account. Uh, the Jews and the Samaritans have a mutual dislike for one another. That may be putting it mildly. There's a, a, a lot of cultural uh, history and things involved uh, in what got them to that point. They share a common set of ancestors that we heard about in our reading, Jacob and his son Joseph. And they had a shared history until about 722 BC when the northern kingdom was uh, taken over and, and everything changed. There's, again, lots and lots of really great history history and interesting stuff to find there. Uh, but for our purposes today, the most important thing is that they did not like each other. Now look at this from John chapter 4, uh, verses 3 and 4. We heard this a minute ago. Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria. On the These two words are really important. He had to go through Samaria on the way. He actually didn't have to at all. Here's a map of the area. He was in Judea. He was going to Galilee. 
And you can see Samaria is right in the middle. Here's the, here's the town where, where our story happens. But it was not uncommon for Jewish people to, instead of going through Samaria, to add miles to their trip and go around Samaria. So great was their dislike for the Samaritans and the area of Samaria that they would walk around it to get where they wanted to go. So when our gospel reading says Jesus had to go through Samaria, we have to ask ourselves, did he really? Did he really have to go through? The answer, I think, is Yes, but not just because of making a quick trip. I think Jesus had to go through Samaria because he had to be at that well at that moment to meet the Samaritan woman. What we find in the reading is that he was there at the well at noon. He had had a long walk from Judea at that point up to Samaria, and he was hot. It was noon, the sun was shining brightly, the hottest time of the day, or at least moving into the hottest time of the day, and he sat down by the well. Now, the woman comes out to collect water, and this would not have happened normally. Water was collected in the mornings when it was cool, or in the evenings when it was cool, but not ever at the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. Water gathering would have been a social gathering for the women of the community. They would come out to check up on each other. What's the latest news? What's the latest gossip? Who's sick? Who's doing well? What's going on in your life? How can I share what's going on in my life? And we don't know exactly why the woman was there. We don't read it explicitly anywhere in the text. But from conversation that she and Jesus have later on uh, in this account, we find out that she has had five husbands, and she's currently living with a man who's not her husband. And the cultural implications of that were, were not great. And so we can assume and pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, definitively, pretty, pretty uh, uh, comfortably assume that she was there at the well at noon because she wanted to avoid the judging looks and stares and whispers of the other people in the community. But here's the truth of what's going on here. Identity brought each of them to that well at that moment. This was not a coincidental Meet up by any means. While she was there to avoid the people in her community, Jesus was there to find her. Jesus, the seeker and the savior of the lost. And so they begin a conversation with him asking, can I have a drink of water? And as we go through their conversation a little bit, listen to the words that the Samaritan woman says and the way that Jesus responds to her, and the way that he redirects her conversation and her thinking. He says, can I have a drink from the well, please? You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She immediately points out the cultural incompatibility between the two of them. You are this. You are a Jew. I am this. I am a Samaritan woman. These things don't work together. They don't fit together. That's all you are, and that's all that I am. But Jesus doesn't respond to her that way. He responds from his true identity. And he says, if you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. I am here, he's saying, to give you God's gift. I'm here to quench a thirst that you don't even know that you have. I'm here to fill an, et an eternal need that goes so far beyond your circumstances, so much deeper than the way that you're looking at it and thinking about it, you can't even name what that need is. He goes on later in, the, in their account, in their conversation, to acknowledge her reality, that she's had five husbands, that she's not even married to the one that, you're, that, he, that she's living with now. And when, she, when he gets a little too close for comfort, she quickly changes the subject and goes back to her original tactic of showing why the two are incompatible with each other. She says, oh, so you must be a prophet. You know so much. Tell me this, prophet guy. Why is it that you Jews, you Jews, insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim we can worship here? We are incompatible. You are this, and I 
am this. And I'm going to keep this as separate as possible and keep the conversation focused on how we are not alike, how we are separated from one another. But Jesus again reads and he brings the conversation back around to his true identity. And he says, the time is coming. Indeed, it's already here. It's here right now, right in front of you. The kingdom of God is present, speaking to you, talking to you right now. When, the worship, when worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, it won't be Jew and Samaritan anymore. It won't be male and female anymore. We will worship God in spirit and in truth. The time is coming. In fact, in me, that time is here and it is now. And then he goes on to reveal to her his true identity. Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. This is the first time in John where Jesus explicitly calls himself the Messiah. It didn't happen in chapter 3 when he was talking to Nicodemus the Pharisee, the religious leader who knew all the things. It happens here in chapter 4 talking to a Samaritan woman, outcast here at the well. In the whole interaction with her, he keeps the conversation focused on who he is and what he's there for, not on their incompatibilities and not on her failures and her faults. It's as if he's saying to her, you are, yes, all of those things that you list, a woman, a Samaritan, a a wife of, of five husbands and living with somebody you're not married to, you are all of those things, but... All of those things is not who you, not all that you are. You are more than just the sum of your parts, more than just the sum of your shortcomings and your failures. In fact, you are something altogether new. You are a child of God. Her um, broken sense of self was not unique to her. She wasn't the only one to have ever thought that way and certainly the only, not the only one who's ever thought that way since that time. In fact, all of us have uh, that, uh, that problem, that tendency to think of ourselves in broken ways. That goes back almost to the very beginning. Back to a garden that God had created beautifully and perfectly. We read about it in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. In that garden, there was a river that flowed out of it. And Genesis 2 tells us that it flowed and gave uh, life to the whole garden, that there were beautiful trees growing delicious fruit all around the garden. It was, maybe you could say, living water. And in that garden, Adam and Eve lived perfectly in harmony with one another and with God. They walked with him, they talked with him, and they were close with him. And they lived out of this beautiful uh, identity that God had given them, created in his very own image. And then we get to chapter 3, and we meet the serpent, the enemy, the devil, Satan, who comes to Eve. And he begins to whisper in her ears lies and half-truths. Why is God holding out on you, he asks her. Why won't he let you eat this fruit? Why does he limit you and keep you from doing this? What isn't he telling you? What doesn't he want you to know? Maybe you're not as close with him as you think you are because he's keeping something back. In fact, Eve, you have to eat this fruit to become like him. You're not good enough as you are. You're not enough as you are. You need to eat this to be more. That's the tactic that the enemy always uses with us. He always whispers these lies into our ears because he wants to keep us wondering. He wants to keep us restless. He wants to perpetuate the problem and keep us anxious and afraid. And his tactics work very well. They leave us vulnerable and ashamed and lost. But Jesus... And those are probably the two most beautiful words that could ever be put right next to each other, but Jesus. Because you know that little conjunction, but, what it does is it says everything that was before is negated because whatever is going to come next is the real truth. But Jesus came to seek and to save. He came to give his life as a ransom. He came to find us in 
area to find us alone and vulnerable by the well. And in his life and his death and resurrection, there is power both to defeat the enemy and to restore things to the way that they were. To restore relationship with God where we'll worship in spirit and in truth, not separated anymore. To restore relationships between men and women, between husbands and wives, between neighbors. To return us to our original purpose. Come back next week to find out more about that. Jesus, our good shepherd, leads us to living water to restore our souls and to give us a new identity as people who belong to him. Now the enemy, though he has been defeated, will continue to work as hard as he can to inflict damage on us. And so to live from this new identity, we have to stay alert, we have to be paying attention because we know Peter tells us that he's out there like a roaring lion walking around seeking who he can devour. So here's a couple of things that will help us to, uh, to live alert and to pay attention and to follow and live from our new identity in Jesus. First one is this, pay attention to whose voice you're listening to. Stay alert and pay attention to whose voice you're listening to. Remember, the enemy's voice is always this. Say things like, you should, like you're not, like you have to do more or be more. And his goal is always to keep us unsure and unsettled. But Jesus, there's those two beautiful words together again. But Jesus reminds us always who he is and what he came for. And he tells us, I am the Messiah. I am the one promised to come and end this tyranny of Satan. I am the one powerful enough to break the, the, uh, the hold that he has on you, to break the chains that he holds you in. I am the one here to give you the gift of God, eternal and living water. You are mine. We have to pay attention to which voice we're listening to. In Jesus, we have a new nature our new self, which is being renewed, look at this, in the knowledge of the image of its creator, taking us back to being more like we were in the beginning as God created us, looking forward to the day when finally we will take on fully that new nature and be fully who God has created us to be. We have to pay attention to whose voice we're listening to and the invitation to put on our new self and to find that image uh, renewed in God. The second thing we need to really do is to, once we've, once we've paid attention to which voice we're listening to, we have to fill our ears and our hearts with the truth of who God says we are. Turn up the volume all the way to 11 to make sure that the, the sound of Jesus' voice and his promises drown out all the lies and the whispers of the enemy of Satan. Look at just some of the things that Scripture tells us that we can turn up the volume on. This is John, now the one who wrote our gospel reading, talking. He says, see how very much our Father loves us? For look, he calls us his children, and that is what we are. Turn the volume up and hear God telling you, you are my child. He says this, look, you are complete through your union with Christ. You are enough. There's not more that you need to go find, more that you need to bring in, more that you need to do. You are complete in your union with Christ. And you can be complete in him because he has power. He has authority. He is the ruler over all things. And he is able to, through his might, mighty power, to make you complete in him. And that is what you are. This life that we live now, we live by trusting in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Turn up the volume on these words from Jesus so that they drown out all of the noise and all of the things that the enemy would whisper into our ears. And finally this, remember, you are not alone. You don't have to sneak to the well by yourself. The Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you is with you. And the body of Christ, your fellow believers, are with you too. Fellow believers broken and restored in Jesus. So let's lean into that. Let's live into that. Let's find each other of who we truly are in Jesus. Let's listen to his voice 
and his alone and look to him to give us the true sense of who we are, our identity found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Amen. Now receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. God be with you this week. Make sure you download that scripture card and spend some time in it this week. And come back next week when we take a look further at our purpose in Christ, having our identity locked and secure in him. What is it that he's calling us to as we live out our purpose? God be with you.